Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, MBC here in Houston, Texas. Now, thank you so much for joining us once again. And today we are still in the book of Romans, chapter 11, starting at verse 19. And we will complete this chapter today, and we will move on. And the topic is, God has not canceled his promises. God has not canceled his promises. So we'll pray. Let's pray and then we'll jump right into the message. Lord, I thank you. I love you so much, Lord. Lord, we glorify you. We magnify you. Lord, as your uh, word will touch someone like today, dear God. Please, Lord, touch someone today, dear God. Teach us how your word, Lord. Teach us um, how your ways and how you think and interact, dear God. We love you so much and we thank you, dear God. Touch your people today, dear God, in a special way. Uh, we need you today, dear God. Help us to study your word, Lord. Holy Spirit, we need you like never before. Holy Spirit, give me guidance. Holy Spirit, give me um, intelligence. I love you so much, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, God has not counseled his promises. Again, Romans chapter 11, verse nine, starting at verse 19. Of course, I have an overview background, so you can get a good picture of what's going on within this chapter. So I really believe there is no better proof of the faithfulness of God than the redemptive history of Israel. No single thing more uh, demonstrates God's faithfulness to his promise than his unfailing love for the nation of Israel. A nation which in fact did everything to negate those promises, everything to violate that love. And still God is true to his promise and true to his love unchangingly and unwaveringly. In spite of their sin, in spite of their rejection, in spite of their unbelief, there is still a place for the nation of Israel in the plan of God. Some might think that because Israel has a nation currently rejected Jesus Christ and his gospel of salvation by grace through faith, that they are forever set aside and that God will have nothing more to do with them. But not so, for God has promised to save Israel. He has promised to bring Israel to blessing and he will keep his promise. Their setting aside is only temporary, and the temporary setting aside of Israel teaches three great things. First of all, it has a definite purpose, verse 11 to 15. It has a definite purpose. Israel's temporary setting aside is for a very special purpose. Notice it, and I'll remind you of it as we read briefly through it. I say then, have they stumbled, that is stumbled in unbelief at the point of Jesus Christ, stumbled in re rejecting the gospel, that they should fall. That is perm permanently and forever and irretrievable and irrecoverable. It is but a temporary one and its purpose that through their fall, and here we talk about their sin, their sin of unbelief and rejection through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And that's the first purpose in the temporary setting aside of Israel. It brought the Gentiles in to become people of blessing, to become the people of witness. You say, well, if the Jews hadn't fallen, would we never have gotten the gospel? Well, of course we would have. If they hadn't, they would have brought us the gospel and they would have been the people of the message. They would have lived out the witnesses that God wanted them to live. But we never would have become that people in the unique way that, that they were. And so because of Israel is set aside, we not only received the gospel, but we have been made the new people of the ministry, the new people of the witness, the new people of testimony, the new channel of blessings to reach the world. And so not only have we received salvation, but we have received the privileged place of ministry, standing in the place of vacated by the unbelieving Israel. So it is not that the Gentiles never would have been redeemed if Israel had believed. It is that we never would have become the people that we've become uniquely called by God to reach the world in their place. And so the first thing we see here is that the purpose was Gentile blessedness, Gentile salvation. And the second purpose, I provoked them to jealousy, the temporary setting aside of Israel brought Gentile blessing and Jewish jealousy. And when the Gentiles became the people of a blessing, it was provoked to the Jews to jealousy so that they would say, how is it that we are the punished? How is it that we are the chastened? How is it that we are the abused? And that's how it's been through their historic uh, history since the rejection of Christ, hasn't it? From the 70 AD desolation, desolation of Jerusalem by the Romans, 
right up until the modern times, they have been a people under tremendous persecution and pressure through all these centuries. And the Church of Jesus Christ has been the blessed and uh, in Israel it has been the chastened. And it is to provoke them to jealousy that they might be drawn back to God and back to Christ, to the roots of blessing. And that's God's plan. So we might say that what Paul is articulating, he is that uh, here is that Gentile blessing is to provoke Jewish salvation, right? So that even God's purpose in setting them aside was to redeem them back. They couldn't be reached when they were the people of blessing. Maybe they can be reached when they become jealous of people who become the people of blessing, they were not responsive to the pe to God when he be when he came and, and said salvation is to the Jews. When he said, I, I come not but for the lost sheep of Israel. And that's what he came for, the lost sheep of Israel. They wouldn't they wouldn't accept him. Um, they wouldn't accept a direct approach from God. And so God now gives them an indirect approach, pouring out blessing on the church, redeem church to provoke that people to jealousy. And the third purpose is the world blessing. Verse 12, if the fall of them has become the riches of the world, that is, if their fall into sin, rejection of Christ has made all of us rich. If the diminishing of them has become the riches of the Gentiles, that again refers to the same thing. Their sin has made us rich by making us the people of blessing how much more will their fullness bless us and and what will happen uh when israel comes to faith in christ what will what what will that usher in in the millennial kingdom the glories of the kingdom promised in the scripture so amen that is our overview and so those are the three purposes those are the three purpose why, purposes why god took israel the people of israel the jewish people through what they went through. Verse 19, and you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Okay. If I can't boast that I am the root, at least I can say I'm better. I'm a better branch than, than the one that was there. It's almost as if Paul recognizes there will be a fight to maintain an anti-Semitic attitude and anti-Jew feeling. Somebody's going to say, well, yes, but after all, I'm sure better than apostate Jews. I'll boast over the branches if I can't say that I'm the source of my own blessedness. Surely I am superior to them. And there's that attitude that the Jews are to be looked down upon. You know, there were years in the past uh, when even Jews became Christians. Gentiles congregation, Gentile congregations were very reluctant to allow them to become a part. And that is true in some cases, even today. We forget that there always been a remnant of truth and that the branches haven't been broken off in all cases. But even the ones that have been broken off, we can't boast against them. 20th verse. Um, well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. The issue isn't who is better and who is worse. The issue isn't. Uh, are Gentiles superior to Jews? The issue isn't racial. The issue isn't um, ethnic. The issue isn't superiority intellectually or any other thing, except the issue is what? Faith. They didn't believe. You believe. That's all. So we believe, and that's all. Um, they didn't believe, and that's, that, that's, that's the only difference. They didn't believe. We believe. Because of unbelief, faith is the only issue. It's the only issue. He said that back in chapter 9, didn't he? In verse 32. Why? Why did they not attain righteousness? Because they saw it not by faith, but by works. They thought they can do it by their own deeds. And he has been making it clear ever since the beginning of the epistle to Romans that uh, salvation is by what? By faith. And that alone is the issue. Verse 20 says, but not high minded. That is, don't get yourself way up here looking down on other people. Don't think high about yourself. Don't have lofty thoughts about your superiority. The only difference between you and the apostate Jews is that he didn't believe, but you did believe. And that's the only difference. You're no more or less worthy and, and of yourself of salvation. It's just that they didn't believe and you did. And that by grace of God, right? You say, well, what does that mean by that? What does it mean by that? Well, a healthy sense of fear is a lot better than pride. Pride always comes before fall. And in verse, in a chapter, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 12, it says, 
Let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. So you ought to fear. Fear what? Hmm. Fear what? Fear God. Fear God. Fear being prideful. Fear being prideful that God will bring you down from that pedestal. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. So you get the picture. I mean, if the people who were the people of the covenant who came out of the uh, 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 the belly of Abraham, who were natural to the trunk of his blessings, if God didn't spare that highly privileged and beloved people, beloved above all other nations, if God didn't spare them in their unbelief, believe this, folks, he won't spare the Gentiles in their unbelief either. So instead of being boastful and proud that we've been grafted in as over against apostate Jews who have been cut off, we ought to be afraid because Israel's unique privileges provided no protection for them against their unbelief. Then the certain certainty and certainly our lack of such privilege will pr provide no protection for us either. You see, uh, we are no people. Uh, we are strangers to the covenants of God. That's right. As Gentiles, we are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We have no hope or without God in the world. We are far off. That's Ephesians chapter two, verse 11 through 13. Uh, we are the no people. We and, and we have become a people by grace, but if God acted the way he did against his own natural branches, then believe me, if we as a church, and he's speaking in the broad terms now, enter into unbelief, he'll cut the church off just as fast as he cut Israel off, just as fast. So you say, well, will that happen? Let me tell you something. It will happen. So you ask me, is the quote unquote church that is now become the people that are the witness of people in the world, the church now, uh, the recipient of the blessing of God, is the church safe? No, it's not safe. If Israel was cut off for, um, for unbelief, believe me, we will be cut off for unbelief also. Also, And I'll say collectively, referring to the church, and there will be left their remnant of believing Jews, just as there is left there the remnant of believing Jews. And the church has no invulnerability. Um, he will damn the church. He will damn the unbelieving, the apostate church, just as he damned an apostate Israel. Verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail, severity, uh, severity uh, but toward you. Good news. If continue in goodness. Goodness, if you continue in goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Isn't that something? You also will be cut off. So continue in goodness. Continue to believe. So those apostate unbelievers' um, severity, the strong word, it means to cut, to cut right off, to cut short. It's a very severe act as if something is going along and all of a sudden, boom, it's cut off instantly. The word is apotomia, to cut off shortly in the Greek. One on the uh, goodness, the word really means kindness. It's used in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. The kindness of God, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be, what, cut off. You see, to be in the place of blessing, we must believe. And when Israel sees believing, they were cut off and only the, the remnant remained. It doesn't mean that they lost uh, their salvation. The trunk of blessing is just that. And the nation as a whole was blessed and God blessed that nation. Some of the people who uh, are in the church of Jesus Christ today who are blessed by just being part of this association, even though they don't believe. But the time is going to come when the apostate church will be cut off and there will be no more blessedness. blessedness. And the only thing that's going to be left is going to be the remnant of the true believers. Christianity is going to go just like Judaism did. Believe me, it will happen. So there's no place for boasting people as if we're better than Israel. The, safe, the same fate awaits the apostate church that awaited the apostate Israel. Gentiles are going to get the same thing Jews got. And the only people who maintain their place in the trunk of the blessing are the faithful Jew and Gentile, the physical and the spiritual seed of Abraham. 23rd verse. And they also, if they did not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So that's always the issue. If they were, if they will believe, they will be what? Grafted in. You see, if they uh, believe, in, believe, they'll be grafted in, for God is 
here it is, able to graph them in again. May I say to you that it is possible. That's what that verse is saying. If they will abide not in unbelief, if they will come to faith, you say what? Zechariah says they will, they'll look on him whom they've pierced and mourn for him as an only son and a fountain of salvation will be open to Israel. The day is coming, I believe it's in tribulation time, when they will believe, they will believe. Remember, 144,000 Jews will uh, come to Christ during that time. And in the tribulation is when the apostate church will be cut off and Israel will be grafted back in and they will again become the, the people of, it, of uh, blessing. The destiny of Israel came by reverse. Uh, verse 23 says, it is possible God is able to do it. Verse 24 for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were gifted contrary to the nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So it's not only possible, it's probable. If we wild olive branches got grafted in, how much more is it probable that the original branches should be grafted in also? So it's not only possible, it is probable. Not only that, it is promised and God keeps his promise. His promises, he does, he keeps his promises. 25th verse, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. <clears throat> so again, now that is, that says it's promised, the promise, he will keep his promise. It's going to come when the fullness of the Gentiles has arrived, then comes the grafting in of Israel. And what is the fullness of the Gentiles? That's the church. When God has all he had, all is redeemed and the church collected together, he'll gather them to himself in the rapture. I believe destroy the apostate church on earth and graft back Israel in the tribulation. And then comes the millennial kingdom and the world and the world blessings. So it's possible. It's probable. It's promised. Are you ready for this? It's positive that it will happen and it will happen. The word of God doesn't lie and God never takes back his promise. He promised he will, what he promised he will fulfill. 26 verse, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away um, ungodliness from Jacob. So all of Israel shall be what? Saved. Isn't that great? It's positive. What is the issue here? The issue is one simple thing. Faith isn't it. Jew or Gentile, uh, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're, gra you're, you're, be you're grafted in. You are grafted in into the place of blessing where the life of God flows through and produces fruit. Wasn't it wonderful to hear those testimonies tonight, today? Um, those Jew and Gentiles, along with all the other, all the ages who have come to faith in God, who have embraced the Savior, are grafted in. Be they natural branches or unnatural they're in the place of blessing. The issue for you is faith. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? 27th verse, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So God makes a promise he keeps and he keeps it. And this was his promise, unconditional. If you go back to Genesis 15 and that mysterious passage, I love it. God makes a covenant not like any other covenant. Very, very unique. He says to Abraham, now, Abraham, you get a lot of dead animals and you lay them out, lay them out on the ground, um, like a, create a, a, a pathway in between the animals, but lay them side by side all the way down, half of each on each side, half of each on this side. And in other words, cut all the animals in half. Don't cut the birds or all you have is a handful of feathers. So stick a dead bird on this side and a dead bird on the other side and half of an animal here and half of an animal on the other side and another half here and another half there. And then he gave to the to Abraham a divine um, anesthetic and knocked him out and he went to sleep. He fell into a deep sleep and the Lord himself, like a smoking lamp in a burning furnace, passed between those pieces. God did the promise himself. He did it himself. He didn't let Abraham do it. He just told Abraham, follow these instructions. Just lay the animal, cut them in half. Lay the animals outside um, on each side, half over here, half over here. And, and, um, and Abraham thought he was going to walk through it, but God put him to sleep and God walked through it. And when God set out to redeem Israel, it was to fill the covenant, which he made with himself. 
And when God makes a covenant with God, nobody's going to break it. And the redemption of Israel is based upon the unconditional covenant that he would bless the people who came out of the uh, lands of uh, Abraham. And the Abrahamic covenant eventually passed into the new covenant, which is equally unconditional and based upon the sovereign purpose and the promise of eternal God himself, who is unwavering in his ability to keep his promise. Listen to Numbers 23, 19, Numbers 23, 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Numbers, that's 20. No, again, Numbers 23, chapter 23, verse 19. And here, verse 28 says, concerning the gospel that they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers concerning the election. And so at verse 28, the Jews are enemies. Presently, they are the enemies of God. They are not his friends. They have been cast away, as it said in verse 15. They have been put aside because of their unbelief. And they are now enemies. It's true in, in relation to the gospel. But look at verse 28 in relation to the election. They are what? Beloved. They are beloved. Now, what is this? Um, the the catomity, um saying, uh, well, on one hand, based on their response to the gospel, they are enemies. But based on God's promise, when he called them, which promised, notice the end of verse 28, he gave to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are beloved. And if you want a good title for Israel, they are Israel, God's beloved enemy. At one in the same time, they are beloved and his enemies. Concerning the gospel, they're enemies. They are enemies. As touching the choice of God, as touching the, the uh, choice of God, they are beloved for the Father's sake. And he reemphasizes a very important thing. The Father here is not God. The apostrophe comes after the S. It's plural fathers. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, to whom God made and reiterate, re reiterated the covenant. In other words, when he elected the people of Israel and gave promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he bound himself to keep that promise. Elect is simply to choose. He chose them, made the promise to their fathers, and now will fulfill that. So in the terms of election, they are still his beloved, even though at the present they are enemies. Israel is, is in a very peculiar position. And don't you and don't you sense in your heart the same feeling? I don't know how you are, but when I look at Israel, when I look at the Jewish people, I have the same sense, the same sense. They that they are the beloved enemy of God. Enemies concerning the gospel, but beloved concerning the election of God. Promise to the fathers to be fulfilled in the future. And so while for the moment there is a hopelessness as we see their enemy profile dominating. We look to the future when their beloved profile will totally dominate in the moment and in the time of salvation. 29th verse. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so God keeps his word and says, verse 29, for the gifts, charisma, grace, gifts, cares, grace uh, for the grace, gifts and calling of God are without. So the gifts, grace, gifts, that's, that's cherish, cherish or charis in the Greek. Uh, repentance or change, boy, that's it. Can you earn grace? Then you uh, could for forfeit it either. If you did nothing to get it, you could do nothing to lose it. It's grace. The grace gifts of God and the calling of God, it's the same term as election, can never be changed. The word without repentance is one word. It's um, metamelos, or metamelomaya, means to regret. A is a, an alpha that adds a negative. God will never regret. He'll never change his mind in regard to his promise. You see, he has integrity. Oh, what a wonderful truth that is. And we can give glory to, God, to a God who has absolute integrity. He is not like men. Are you weary of the fact uh, that men make promises they never keep? Then look at God in contrast. Men make covenants and break them all the time, vows and violate them constantly. God has integrity. Bless his name for that. And so we rejoice then, and we can say when he comes to that great doxology, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways finding out. And then in verse 36, to whom he 
be glory forever. Amen. For he is a God who is sovereign and he is a God of integrity. Let's look at verse 30. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. So the ye are the Gentiles and the they are the Jews. The ye are the Gentiles, the they are the Jews. Now, remember how Paul has put his argument together. Yes, chapter nine says Israel is set aside. That's in the plan of God uh, temporarily and partially. Chapter 10 says they are set aside because of their unbelief. But chapter 11 says they, they are not set aside altogether because there's a remnant of believers, right? And secondly, they're not set aside permanently. They've only been set aside temporarily. And they've been a set aside, and they've been set aside temporarily because of their unbelief. That is the Jewish nation. They are not the nation of witnesses now. They are not the nation of blessing as a nation, though individual Jews are surely redeemed who believe in Christ, but they are not the nation of blessing. They are not the nation of testimony and witness. They are not God's special people to take the gospel to the world. They have been set aside because of their unbelief. And the Gentile church has been brought into the place of, of their has been brought into the place of blessing. We now are the witness for people. We are the ones to be going out and ministering and be on missions, the Gentile church. And so in verse 30, he says of us, and by the way, this indicates that the majority of the congregation in Roman church was indeed Gentile. He addresses them as such, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet ye yet have not obtain mercy through their unbelief. They have not yet have not obtained mercy through unbelief. Now you understand what he's saying. The reason the gospel went to the Gentiles was because the Jews rejected it. They rejected God. They rejected Jesus Christ. So in the sense, we owe our salvation to the Jewish unbelief, don't we? That's what Paul is saying here. We have no reason to boast. We have no reason to be proud. We have no reason to look down on a Jew. The truth of the matter is instead of despairing on them because of their unbelief, in the sense we sort of can be thankful because through their unbelief, we were grafted into the place of blessing. By the hardness of their hearts, we were brought to the gospel. So in the time past, we who didn't believe God, we who are, when were not the people of the covenant, read Ephesians 2, we were strangers to the promises of God. We were aliens. We were outcasts. We were despised. We were non-believers. We had none of these privileges, but because of their unbelief, we have been brought into the gospel, turned into the Gentiles. The gospel went to the Gentiles. Now notice what verse 30 is saying. Then in the reference to our point about God's generosity, we are what we are by God's mercy. That's his point, by his mercy. It's not because we were more worthy than anyone else. No, the only reason we even come into this place of blessing is because of Jewish unbelief. We're, we're no more worthy than they are. And if we did not believe, we would be cast out as well, as we saw earlier in this chapter. Verse 31. Even so, these also have now been disappointed. I mean, disobedient. I'm sorry. Even let me read it again. Even so, these also have now been disappoint, disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. OK, our salvation is not by the merits. No, it's not. It's by the mercy. We can, we can feed the homeless all day long, but it's not by our deeds, our merits, our good merits. No, that doesn't make, that doesn't do anything as far as giving us mercy. We receive mercy through salvation. And it is not because we are worthy, but rather because we are unworthy. And these people levels everybody. Um, it levels the Gentile and it levels the Jew. The Gentile would like to look down at a Jew and say, you were set aside, you were used you used to be with God. You used to be God's people. And now you're set aside and perhaps boast in fact that they that we as Gentiles have been grafted in to the place of blessing. Listen, we're not there because we were worthy. We're we're there because God in mercy granted us to believe. And the day will come when God grants that in mercy to the Jew and the Jew will be grafted back into the place of blessing. The issue in both cases is the mercy and nothing beyond mercy. It is mercy to the Gentiles. It is mercy to the Jew. It is merit in neither case. And so we say then that the salvation is based on generosity of God, nothing more. Paul says in his own personal testimony, uh, 1 Timothy 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me 
in that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and pr prosecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Isn't that a beautiful testimony? It's mercy. It's mercy. And uh, God's mercy is so marvelous that the Bible tells us in Psalm 136 that his mercy is forever. His mercy is forever. First Kings 3, chapter 3, verse 6. His mercy is great. Psalm 86, verse 5. His mercy is plenteous. And so, and, and so in Romans 9, 15, we learn that his mercy is even selective. Is even selective. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. That is amazing. So if you ever for one moment think there's something that commends you to God, you have missed it. There is nothing in the past. There is nothing in the future. There is nothing in the present that's, that commends you to God other than the mercy granted to you because of Jesus Christ and the faith in him. That's why in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, God is called the father of mercies. When all thy mercies, O God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view, I'm lost on wonder, love, and praise. Verse 32. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. So that word means to shut up in a prison. God has imprisoned them all in unbelief in order that he might have what? Mercy on them all. Now, let me tell you this is a little lesson in theology. And the theologians through the centuries have struggled with what is known as the problem of theodicy. And so, or the problem of um, origination, origin of sin and why God allowed it. Origin of sin and why God allowed it, okay? I think... That is one of the greatest answers in all scriptures. You know why God allowed sin, because God has in his nature an attribute, and the attribute that God possesses is his nature is an attribute of mercy. And because of God, and because God is a God of mercy, and God must reveal the mercy and must be glorified for that mercy, God has to exercise that mercy. And the only way that, that the mercy can be exercised is where there is sin. So in order for God to reveal himself as a mercy God, God must permit sin so that he can show his mercy toward the sinner. Understand that. I hope you do. A very essential understanding. In fact, you can ask a question. Uh, you can ask the questions about it. You can ask me questions about it. And I'll tell you, God does this and why God allow this and why does this happen? And the ultimate answer, you will go back in time again and again. And God must allow that to happen in order to demonstrate and reveal a char characteristic that he possesses so that he may receive the full glory due to his name. So it is all about mercy and there needs to be no other answer. You see, uh, he says it here in verse 32, God has concluded them all in unbelief. What do you mean by them all? Jew and Gentile. He's wrapped the whole world up in unbelief. And we saw that, didn't we? Back in Romans chapter three, where it says in verse nine, Jew and Greek or Gentiles are all under sin. There's none righteous. No, not one. There's not no, no one, not there's none that understands, none that seeks after God. They're all gone out of the way. And so none of us are good. Get that out of your mouth. Get that out of your, your speech. Uh, none of us are good. None of us are. So stop saying people are good. They are together become unprofitable. And why does God want the whole world convicted of sin? Why does God stop every mouth? So that all men may be seen to be unworthy and wherever God moves in salvation, he is then demonstrating the attribute of mercy. You see, very important. He shut them up in prison of sin. He shut them up in the prison of guilt. Verse 32 is saying he shut them up in the prison of judgment so that he might demonstrate his mercy. You say, yes, because yes, but not all receive mercy. Yes, that's right, because he also needed to demonstrate his wrath. The reason there's a hell is that God may reveal his wrath and be glorified and all that exists in the terms of attitude, in the terms of thoughts, in the terms of created physical things. All that exists ultimately is existing for the purpose of allowing God to display his glory. And so he concludes the whole world in unbelief. Hmm. And the word unbelief is a kind of inter interesting word. It's not maybe the normal word that you would um, anticipate coming from the root of pistui. It is the word of epithe, and it uh, basically means not to allow oneself to be convinced. He basically, and 
This is really interesting. He basically has allowed men intellectually and morally to fall into a state where he does not allow himself to be convinced of the truth of God in the scripture so that the only way he can be saved is outside of his own power by the mercy of God. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian because God has been merciful to you. That's the reason. So um, that all the glory goes to him. All the praise goes to him. Marvelous thought. That's what it does. All the praise, all the glory goes to him. And that's what he's doing. He's getting glory out of everything. He's getting glory out of everything. Verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom, knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his path and ways, his past founding out. So in the doxology itself, we see another uh, one other characteristic of God, which we'll see very readily. And that is God's incomprehensibility. Not this is staggering. Um, now this is staggering to the mind. We really can't spend very much time discussing it, but having completed his argument and having affirmed at the end of God's sovereignty, God's integrity, God's generosity to Jew and Gentile the, and the plan comes all the way into completion. Ultimately, the Gentile church is redeemed and ultimately the Jewish nation is redeemed and the whole plan is going to work out of marvelously and beautifully and gloriously and having identified God in a lofty strain of praise as a sovereign, faithful, merciful, saving God who controls history, who fulfills his promise, who is the merciful to his undeserving sinners. He then breaks into the song, song in verse 33 and the theology becomes a song. And he says, oh, the depths of the riches, wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Hmm. And so, um, and like a mountain uh, climber, he has climbed the peak of his argument, the peak of his thought, and he stands at the summit of his Alps, and he looks down and surveys everything that is beneath him and all that he has covered. And he is in absolute awe of this unbelieving, unfo um, unfolding redemptive plan, and he bursts into the wonderful and praise. It must have been a happy moment when you compare it with the beginning of this section, chapter 9, verse 1 where he talked about continual sorrow and heaviness of heart as he thought about the present lostness of Israel. But now, as he thinks about the future salvation of the nation, he rejoices. Verse 34, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become the counselor? So anybody, any volunteers, anybody know God's mind's perfect? Oh, I understand exactly what he, what he do, what he's doing. The Lord knows the mind of his creatures, but the creatures don't, don't know the mind of the Lord. Our ways are not his ways, his ways are not our ways. I mean, you don't think an, an, an ant can understand your thought process, observe. Of course, we don't think ants can observe our thought processes. No, we can't either. But not an, as observed as to think you understand God's mind. Even when, he, when he's revealed himself, all you know is that he's revealed and that often leaves you with more mystery that you had before he revealed anything. And the natural man understandeth not the things of God. He cannot know them. He don't understand them. And by the way, this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, out of the Septuagint version. He's quoting the Old Testament for who hath known the mind of the Lord. And the answer is what? Nobody. Nobody could know what God was doing until it is unfolded and revealed to them. And no one is the witness to the infinite death of depth of mind of the mind of God. That's why it's so stupid when we second guess him and understand it and understand of praising him when we question him or when we think we've got him in a box. And that 35th uh, verse says, or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. Stop right there. Excuse me. Oh, I like that. What does that say? What is it saying? Who loaned something to God or gave something to God? Now God is in his debt. So who has who has God in in debt to him? Anybody. Ridiculous. Who has God under uh, obligation to perform? Ridiculous. Let me tell you something, people. That is a very important verse. God doesn't owe anybody anything, anything. He's not in debt to any one of us. So Job 41, 11 who first gave to him and now God has to pay him back. What did you or I or any human being ever do to make God be in our debt? Nothing, nothing. His favor is never ever owed to anyone, never ever earned to anyone and never ever given as a compensation from God. 
It is always infinite grace, always infinite grace. In fact, the truth is we owe God an unpayable debt, don't we? Yes, we do. Like the man in Matthew 18, listen to me. There is no merit in us to put any constraint on God for anything. God is self-sufficient, sovereign, free from any obligation. He doesn't owe any one of us anything, not a Jew, not a Gentile, none of us. He doesn't owe us anything because of merits, because of our good merits. It doesn't matter. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe God everything. You say, well, then why is he going to fulfill his plan? Because of his own character, because he is a sovereign God who keeps his promises, who is gracious. But don't for one minute imagine that You've got him figured out. He's incomprehensible. I'm telling you, he's incomprehensible. You cannot comprehend what he's doing. Like this, the Bible is revealed. It has to be. It had to be revealed so we'll know more about God. But we don't really know the total God because it's a lot. It's revealed, but still, we have a long way to go. But we'll understand it better by and by. Verse 36, our last verse. For of, whom, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I love that. To God be the glory forever. Amen. He is the source of, I mean, for of him, he is the, is the means. And through him, he is the goal. And to him are all things. We made all things for himself. He made all things, I'm sorry. He made all things for himself. Thou art worthy, O Lord, it says in Revelations 4 and 11, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and we were created. What a great climax. And I hope that you can join with Apostle in that last part of 36 and give him glory forever. In everything you do, give God glory, all praise and all glory. As Jude said it so beautifully, to the only wise God, our Savior, be the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And what a conclusion to a great doxology. And so God has not canceled his promises. God has not counsel his promises. Thank you again for joining us for our Bible study. Please um, come back next Wednesday and please tune in this Friday evening for the pastoral moment where I get to really encourage you with the word of God. Have a blessed rest of your week and um, God bless you and please um, turn, turn and tune to our Sunday services. We are having a marvelous time in the Lord on Sunday mornings at our location. God bless you and thank you. For we are the Church of Love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.